All right, in the previous lectures, we talked about using coordinates to describe the spatial location or geometry and shape of geographic features. We learned two types of coordinate system, geographic coordinate system or GCS and Cartesian or planar coordinate system or PCS. Geographic coordinate system was defined on a 3D sphere and uh, the unit of measurements were angles of rotation called latitude and longitude and projected coordinate system was defined on a 2D plane and the unit of measurements were length units such as miles, kilometers, feet. But uh, here we made two unrealistic assumptions. We assume that our Earth is either a plane in projected coordinate system or is a perfect sphere in geographic coordinate system. But this is not true in reality. What is reality? The reality is our Earth system is neither a 2D plane nor a 3D sphere. Reality is our Earth is actually a very misshapen object with very bumpy surface and flattened a little bit into polar areas. So the question is how we can measure a spatial location accurately on this misshapen object. So in today's class, we will talk more about measuring a spatial location on real surface. This is an important topic in GIS. Let's start with the first module. So how we can measure, how we can make measurements on this bumpy and irregular shape, which looks like a potato. The solution is to find a mathematically defined shape to approximate Earth's surface. So in this lecture, we will discuss the approximation process step by step. And the first step is we will use a geoid to approximate the real surface of the Earth. But what is geoid? Think about a world of water, an imaginary sea that covers world planets and is not affected by wind, by waves and the moon, but only affected by gravity. That is geoid. So technically the geoid is a 3D surface shown as this figure and uh, is defined by empirical measurements that describe constant gravity at any location on Earth. So we use this shape trying to approximate the real surface of the Earth. Geoid has a sort of semi-smooth surface. It is less bumpy than the real surface and is an empirical model of real surface of Earth because it is a world of sea, a world of water. It coincides very well with the mean sea level uh, or MSL of the entire planet. That is why geoid is also widely used as a reference of elevation or zero height. When we say elevation of New York City is three, uh, 33 feet, it is measured from geoid. But geoid is not smooth enough to approximate the shape of the Earth for measurement of locations. In the next step, we approximate geoid by an ellipsoid. What is ellipsoid? It is a sphere uh, that's uh, slightly flattened or squashed at the poles. So the ellipsoid sometimes is called a spheroid and is an ideal and a smooth uh, surface which is mathematically defined. It can be used to partially fit the geoid. In this figure, uh, this green color shape is our real surface, okay? And uh, very irregular and very bumpy. And we use geoid. The first step is to use geoid, which is this blue one. And we use geoid uh, to approximate the real surface. So this blue shape uh, is geoid or the mean sea level which is still is not a smooth but is used to approximate the real surface of the earth and ellipsoid or spheroid is orange dashed line as you can see and um, which is ideal a smooth surface we can use it to partially fit the geoid so it is based on the ellipsoid that we can measure our latitude and longitude for any location and here is an example of the ellipsoid, which is a smooth surface and flattened at the pole. Any ellipsoid can be defined mathematically by two parameters, the length of the major axis or A and the length of the minor axis or B. And based on A and B, 
we can further calculate a ratio we call flattening factor and here is the formula a minus b divided by a and uh, which gives us how flat the polar areas will be in the ellipsoid okay so if major and minor axis were equal if a equals to b uh, so the flattening factor the flattening ratio will be zero which means it's a, a sphere it's not an ellipsoid so you can easily uh, define an ellipsoid based on only two parameters a and b you can easily define the ellipsoid so many different ellipsoids have been developed by scientists across the world because with only a and b with only two parameters you can define ellipsoid all of the ellipsoids fall into two categories regional ellipsoid and global ellipsoid so regional ellipsoids have been established to fit geoid well only over a specific region like a city or country in this figure this red ellipsoid is an example of the regional ellipsoid which fits very well for a specific region only this region okay so this blue shape is a geoid for example in this table Bessel ellipsoid uh, developed in 19 uh, sorry, developed in 1841, uh, only fits Central Europe, Chile, and Indonesia. And here is the length of the major uh, axis, the length of the minor axis, and the flattening factor. Okay. Other examples of regional ellipsoids are Clark. So you can see that it's good only for specific areas, most of Africa, France, or another Clark, North America, Philippines. So uh, these are examples of the regional ellipsoid. The second category of the ellipsoid is global ellipsoid, which means, however, they don't fit perfectly for a specific area. They can minimize the overall mismatch across the entire world. Okay, so in this figure, this green uh, ellipsoid is a global ellipsoid that approximates the geoid, which is this blue. Uh, shape for the entire world okay so examples of the global ellipsoid are GRS 80 so it's a worldwide ellipsoid and 80 means that it's developed in the year 1980 and these are the parameters of the ellipsoid a b and flattening factor and another example is uh, widely used WGS 84 uh, which also is used in the GPS now a close up in this module, we talked about three surfaces. The, the real surface of the Earth, which is very bumpy, including all planes, uh, depressions, and mountains, and it's very hard to do measurements on it. That's the truth. And uh, then we talked about geoid, which is the first approximation of the Earth. And uh, it is very still bumpy and can be thought of the world of uh, sea that covers the entire Earth and is not affected by winds by waves and moon but only affected by gravity geoid still is not a smooth for mathematic measurements so finally we can use a mathematically defined uh, ellipsoid to fit partially the geoid ellipsoid is ideal a smooth surface mathematically defined to fit the geoid and it is based on the ellipsoid that we can define our latitude and longitude for a location so more about these three surfaces. Between the uh, three surfaces, we can define different types of heights. The elevation or altitude that we talk uh, every day is the height from the geoid. Okay, so if this is the geoid and if this is the surface of the Earth, from geoid to surface of the Earth is the height that we talk every day. As you can see, it is it has nothing to do with the ellipsoid. Okay. And it's also called uh, orthometric height. So no matter which ellipsoid you use for your study, the elevation will remain constant and will not be affected because the height only depends on the geoid, which is mean sea level. So uh, in the previous module, we talked about ellipsoid that is used to approximate the shape of the real Earth. The question is how to measure location on the ellipsoid. As I said, latitude and longitude are measured on ellipsoid, but how? The answer is using horizontal and vertical data. What are they? 
So let's talk about horizontal datum. Horizontal datum is a reference for uh, measuring latitude and longitude for any location on Earth. Horizontal datum has two components. First, an ellipsoid is chosen to uh, fit the local geoid the best. Second, a set of reference points with accurate measurements of latitude and longitude are used to measure latitude and longitude for any location nearby. So let's talk about each component one by one. So the first component is a chosen ellipsoid that best fits the geoid of our study area. So here is a list of ellipsoids you can choose, but you should choose them based on where your study area is. If your study area is only about a country or just a city, it's locally defined, probably it's better to use regional ellipsoid. This figure, this ellipsoid uh, fits geoid only in this region. But if your study area is a global study, so probably you have to use a global ellipsoid such as GRS80 or WGS84. So after you choose an ellipsoid, now you can define poles of the ellipsoid, right? So here is the ellipsoid, we have North Pole, South Pole, and also we can define equator which cuts the ellipsoid to half, right? Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. And also, uh, we can define parallel to the equator like this. Okay, so if this is equator, parallel to equator, it helps us to identify latitudes. And also, if you link these two poles, uh, we can uh, define the meridians, the longitudes. And then, uh, the origin of the system can be defined as the intersection of the prime meridian, which passes from Greenwich meridian, and also the equator. Okay, so the intersection of them gives us the origin of the ellipsoid. So, but the problem is the coordinate system, uh, this coordinate system only gives us a framework which tells us where origin is and what is the scale of measurement. The challenge is origin in most cases cannot be observed directly because uh, we know the origin of the geographic system is uh, somewhere in West Africa. So the problem is when you cannot see the origin, it's really hard to measure the angles of rotation from origin to define the latitude and longitude for any location. That's why we need some auxiliary information for practical measurement, for more accurate measurement of the latitude and longitude for any location. So uh, to address this problem, we use reference points. And reference points are very accurately measured locations. In most uh, cases, reference points are called benchmarks and are made of brass uh, discs that are embedded into concrete or rocks. Maybe you have seen some benchmarks on the street. These points uh, have been accurately measured uh, latitude and longitude. And based on these benchmarks, we can further calculate the latitude and longitude for any location nearby. So this uh, map shows you the distribution of benchmarks across the entire United States. And each benchmark costs thousands of dollars to be established. And it has very, very accurate location of latitude and longitude. So from benchmark, you can calculate the latitude and longitude for any location uh, nearby. So this calculation shows you how we can measure the latitude and longitude for any location such as S3 based on two benchmarks, S1 and S2. Basically, we need to measure angles between points using sine rules and then plug them into this formula to uh, calculate the latitude and longitude for any location. So this image shows you the surveyors actually use a tonal station to measure angles between an unknown points to these two benchmarks and then further calculate the latitude and longitude for any point around benchmarks. Commonly used uh, horizontal datum are named by their fitted areas, such as North America datum or NAD, which obviously fits North America the best. Others are Australian and European geodetic datum that are choosing the uh, regional ellipsoid. The last one is WGS84 or uh, World Geodetic System, which chooses a global ellipsoid. So these three uh, datum are 
widely used in the United States. The North American datum NAD27, uh, which was established in 1927, NAD 83 established in uh, 1983, and World Geodetic System 1984 or WGS84. So let's talk about each one by one. So NAD 27 actually uses Clark 1866 as ellipsoid, and it has 26,000 benchmark uh, accurately, which are accurately measured latitude and longitude. So these were two components of the datum of the NAD 27. And NAD 83 is more sophisticated. First of all, it chooses global ellipsoid, which is GRS 80. And also you can see the number of benchmark is almost 10 times more than NAD 27. So the measurements of uh, in the NAD 20, NAD 83 is significantly more accurate compared to the NAD 27. World Geodetic System 1984 or WGS 84, this datum is the datum used by our GPS navigation. It is probably the most widely used datum for worldwide studies and it has developed by the US Department of Defense. So this map shows you the benchmark across the entire world used by this datum. WGS84 datum uses WGS84 ellipsoid and survey benchmark are distributed worldwide. Sometimes in GIS you may see for the same location you have different latitude and longitude measurement. This is because you are using different datums because different datums are based on different selection of ellipsoid and different sets of reference point. So this figure shows you the shifts between measurements of the same location by using NAT27, NAT83, and WGS84. So as you can see, the biggest shift is between NAT27 and NAT83, almost uh, 40 meters. While you can see shifts between, is very small between NAT83 and WGS84. So uh, the shift is tends to be a small if two datums were developed in the similar years, such as NAT83 and WGS84. And you can see the error is less than one meter. We know Earth surface is actually a 3D surface, but horizontal datum only helps you to measure the 2D location on Earth surface, which is a pair of latitude and longitude. Latitude corresponds to Y, and longitude corresponds to X component. So the question is, how do you measure elevation for a location? In this case, we should use vertical datum. And vertical datum is uh, the reference to measure elevation. It's a network or sets of benchmark points with very accurately measured heights. So these are examples of the vertical datum uh, benchmark that shows accurate elevation for the reference point. Again, they are made of brass disc and embedded into concrete and rocks. And similar to a horizontal datum, the vertical datum can be regional uh, or global, depending on which zero surface you choose. Zero surface is where the elevation starts to be counted. Global vertical datum is based on the mean sea level or MSL of the entire world, but regional vertical datum is usually defined based on the local measurements of the mean sea level or local shoreline height. And then after that, after you define the zero uh, elevation, using the leveling, you can measure elevation for the nearby locations. So uh, commonly used vertical datum in the US are National Geodetic Vertical Datum established in 1929, NGVD 29, and also uh, North American uh, Vertical Datum of 1988 or NAVID 88. So this is actually a measurement report. You should be able to understand this chart. First of all, we can see this measurement chooses NAD 83 as the horizontal datum. And based on the selection of this datum, the, mm, the horizontal uh, location was measured as latitude and longitude, okay? So here is uh, degree, minute, second, and degree, minute, second for this location for the uh, horizontal, for the latitude and longitude. And uh, also the, this measurement uh, uses NAVD, which is vertical datum for elevation. And you can see that the elevation is this meters or uh, this number fit. 
So now let's talk about map projection. The first uh, question is why we need map projection, why it is necessary. Uh, in many projects, when you do GIS analysis, uh, you only focus on a specific small area, such as a city or a community or a couple of states. So uh, you can see the earth surface as a flat plane. So you can disregard the curvature of the, of the earth if your study area is small. That's why we may want to use a 2D Cartesian coordinate system rather than 3D geographic coordinate system. The question is how do you go from 3D, uh, 3D surface to 2D flattened map and how we can convert all of the measurements of latitude and longitude degree to the lengths you need such as miles and fits. So we have to use map projection. What is map, but what is map projection? Map projection is any method of representing the surface of a sphere or ellipsoid onto a plane or simply converting from 3D to 2D is map projection. The question here is why map projection is necessary, why we don't use globe for navigation for our analysis. There are two reasons. First, globes are awkward to be used in practice such as drawing. It is very hard to draw something on globe uh, compared to drawing something on plane. And also it is awkward for navigation. For example, if you want to navigate in the small city uh, to see all details, probably you need to have a map in the scale of 1 over 24,000. That means you should carry a very large globe with 500 meter diameter for navigation in this city. That is inconvenient. And the second reason is globes are uh, relatively expensive compared to the paper maps. That's why we need map projection to work on 2D plane rather than the 3D sphere. Now let's talk about components of map projection. The traditional way of doing the projection is to first draw maps on a transparent globe. So we draw our maps on this globe, uh, or technically this is the transparent ellipsoid, and then we place a light source above the ellipsoid and also a projection surface under or a paper under the ellipsoid. Then we turn on this light and then the information will be projected on this surface from this globe will project it on the projection surface. So any map projection is composed of three parts or elements, light source, ellipsoid and projection surface. Combination of these elements produce many types of map projection. So first look at light source. Different position of light source can affect the resulting map. For example, you can place light source at the center of the ellipsoid called uh, mnemonic projection. You can place light source at the polar areas, which calls uh, uh, a, st a stereographic map projection, or you can place light source at infinity and parallel lights will hit the ellipsoid. This is called orthographic uh, projection. So this is about light source. Second, regarding the selection of ellipsoid, we talked about it several times. You should choose ellipsoid that best fits the geoid. If your study area is only a small city or country, probably you can choose a local or regional ellipsoid. Or if your study area is entire world, you can choose a global ellipsoid such as GRS80 and WGS84. And the last component is a projection surface, which is the most complicated one. You can choose different type of projection surface. You can choose a plane uh, which starts flat and stays flat after projection or you can choose any developable surface such as a cone or cylinder which starts rolled and then you have to open it and then ends uh, flat after projection. So in most cases there are three types of projection surface you can use. A plane, a cone, and a cylinder and all of them are developable. The contact line between the projection surface and ellipsoid is often called a standard parallel. Okay, so these red lines is the contact of the uh, cone and also the ellipsoid or here is the standard parallel. Okay, so and the parallels are particularly important to the accuracy each issue 
uh, which we will talk about them in the next few slides. So uh, the relative position of projection surface to the ellipsoid also matters. If you choose a plane as your projection surface, where you place the tangent point will determine the coverage of the projected map. It usually uh, will be the area surrounding the tang tangent point. For example, if you place the tangent point uh, in the North Pole area, projection map will cover the North Pole area and the surrounding areas. Or if you place a uh, plane uh, near to somewhere in Brazil, then you will have a projection map of Brazil and the surrounding areas. So let's look at the relative position of a cone. So you can place the cone just touching the ellipsoid, which will produce only one standard parallel, which is a tangent line. You can use uh, this cone uh, to cut the ellipsoid, uh, which produces two standard parallel. This is called a secant uh, projection. So if you use cylinder as projection surface, you have three options depending on the orientation of the cylinder. It can be a vertical cylinder, which produces this map. It can be a transverse uh, cylinder, produces this map. It can be an oblique cylinder, which produces this map. So you may ask yourself, why do we need uh, various type of map projection? And the answer is because none of the map projections are perfect. All map projections have some distortions. Okay. Consider this tangering as a 3D sphere. So map projection is moving from 3D to 2D, right? When we flatten it, there is always somewhere being stretched and somewhere being compressed. That's the distortion, okay? So all of the map projections have some sort of distortions, okay? You can't find any map projection without distortion. And for example, let's say this curve from here to here. So it represents the ellipsoid as 3D sphere. And this a straight line uh, represent the projection surface or 2D paper. And when we put the projection light here, so we're going to go from 3D to 2D. That's projection, right? So then you can see that the real curve from big A to big B, from here to here, after the projection will be little a to little b, right? So this part. So you can see that um, after projection, the real curve has been shortened, right? And also this curve on the ellipsoid from big D to big E. After projection is stretched, right? So, and because no projection is perfect, we can only choose a map projection that is best for our purpose. So map projection can be classified uh, into three categories, conformal, equal area, and equi equidistance. And conformal can preserve angle, shape, or direction of geographic features. And feature outlines look the same on the map as they do on the Earth. So this type of projection is very good for visualization, but sacrifices distance and area. So an application of conformal is navigation in the sea or ocean, because conformal pro um, projection preserves the direction or in mil military purposes direction and angle is more important than the area or distance this is uh, an application of the conformal projection okay so here is also uh, is a map of the conformal projection you can see that the shapes look normal but look at the size of the russia so the size of the russia is very big why because the conformal projection doesn't preserve the area it only preserves the shape, okay? The other map projection is equal area projection. As its name says, it preserves area of geographic features, but meanwhile uh, will sacrifice their shape and also distance. So the area in this map projection are identical to area on the Earth's surface. An application of equal area map projection is in the cadastre or land use map. The area of the building or agricultural land or residential lands must be preserved after projection. And this is a map of uh, equal area projection. For each continent, the area is the same as its uh, area on the ground, er, ground 
but uh, considering the map scale but size of area is true okay but you can see the shapes have been distorted they look like kind of weird right and the third type of projection is equal distance uh, which preserve distance in certain direction and meanwhile will sacrifice the area and shape the lengths of the particular lines in the map are the same as the lengths of the original lines on the real surface so this is an example of the equal distance projection so distance between particular two lines are the same as distance uh, on the real surface and meanwhile the shape and area are sacrificed an application of equidistance projection is the map of airline distance from a city to another city so a particular map projection can have any of these three properties okay so there is no map projection that can have all of these properties at the same time there is no map projection can uh, uh, preserve shape area and distance okay so there is a mathematic proof for that and also there is no map projection that can even uh, preserve two of these properties there is no map projection that can have for example preserve con is conformal and equal area it is not possible okay now let's move on to the last module of this lecture in this module we will learn more about a specific map projection that are widely used across the world so we will first look at the standalone projection method and then combo projection such as UTM. So let's just start with important standalone projection and the first one is Lambert conformal conic projection. So Lambert is a projection widely used in the United States. Lambert basically is the name of the inventor and conformal means the projection will preserve the angles and shape of geographic features and conic means this projection uses a cone as projection surface so this projection uses a cone to cut the ellipsoid so you can see that it cuts the ellipsoid which produces to a standard parallel one and two so and the two standard parallel or bands runs from east to west okay so major characteristics of Lambert projections are distortions are minimized within this band so we have very low distortion within the band uh, uh, between these two standard parallels but uh, beyond these two standard parallels outside of this band distortion will increase okay so that's why the Lambert projection method is very good for areas that are extended from east to west such as United States and it also is conformal which means that the shapes are preserved another widely used standalone projection method is called albers equal area conic and albers is the name of the inventor equal area means the projection preserves area meanwhile sacrificing the shape and distance and conic means this projection uses a cone as projection surface so this projection is also widely used in the United States by many agencies and areas are proportional to those on the earth again uh, this projection uses a cone to cut the ellipsoid which produces two standard parallel and the bands running from east to west and the distortion is minimized within the band and the beyond the band distortion will increase which is again good for east-west extensive study areas such as United States and the th third standalone uh, pro map projection is transverse mercator or TM uh, this is also a widely used projection not only for the United States but also the entire world this projection uses a cylinder as projection surface but the orientation is transverse or horizontal cylinder and there is uh, only one touching line okay so this is the only one touching line between the projection surface or cylinder and ellipsoid which produces central meridian okay uh, the major characteristics of the TM is that distortion is least uh, near to the central meridian okay and as we move away from cent central meridian distortion will increase so because central meridian is running from north to south so uh, this projection is good for the north to south extensive study areas okay some countries like Chile 
they are extended from north to south. So this map projection TM is good for those countries. And uh, this projection is conformal, which means that the shape is preserved, uh, but area and distance are sacrificed. TM is very important map projection because it also will be used in the universal transfers Mercator or UTM that we're going to talk about it now. So now we have talked about the three standalone projection method. Let's look at the most complicated projection, uh, the most widely used projection that you probably have heard about that is UTM. So UTM is used in uh, the United States, Canada, and many other countries. That's why it's called universal. Second, uh, it's, it's transverse Mercator or uses a horizontal cylinder as projection surface. So this is not a standalone projection. This is actually a composition or collection of many projections together. First of all, this projection uh, system divides the entire world uh, into 60 north to south zones, like this picture. Okay, so 60 zones from north to south. And each zone is going to be 60 degree, right? Because 60 times 6 is 360, which is the entire world. So zones are numbered from 1 to 60 from west to east, starting from 180 degree west in Alaska and uh, and south to north lengths of each zone starts from 80 degrees south to 84 degree north. Okay, so this uh, map projection is not for the entire world. So it's from almost here, uh, 80 degrees south to 84 degree north. So it doesn't cover the polar areas. Okay, so so beyond the 80 degrees south to 84 degree north uh, is not covered in the uh, UTM because only few people live in these areas and also it's a there is a uh, few studies concern about these areas okay so polar regions are excluded from UTM and we use equator to divide each zone to north and south so we have 60 zone and each zone is divided to north and south okay as you can see in this figure so each zone is a slice of ellipsoid and is projected independently by TM, okay? So first of all, it is a slide and then it's projected using the transverse Mercator that we talked about in the previous slide. And each projection has its own Cartesian coordinate system and its own origin. So air surface is actually projected onto 60 independent UTM zones so because it's TM, distortion, as you know, distortion for TM is minimized along the central meridian. So and each zone has its own central meridian, right? So and also each zone has its own origin, okay? Projected coordinates in the zone cannot be directly used for other zones, can only be used within the same zone, okay? Now let's look at the zone map for the entire world, which... Uh, which zone we should use for Cleveland, Ohio? Let's see where Cleveland is. So Cleveland is almost here, right? So zone 17 uh, can be used for the Ohio in the Northern Hemisphere. So Ohio or Cleveland is in the UTM zone 17, but it is in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, so zone 17 North is used for Cleveland, Ohio. How about the central meridian? Because we know that each zone has a central meridian, okay? So how about the central meridian for zone 17? So here is zone 17, uh, which is from 84 degree west to 78 degree west. And we know that central meridian is in the center of the, uh, of the zone, okay? So it's a middle of these two numbers. So, so the value is going to be 78 plus 84 divided by 2. So the longitude uh, for the central meridian is 81 degree west. That's the central meridian of the zone 17 north for Cleveland. And the last part is about coordinates in the UTM projection. UTM has a planar or 2D coordinate system because we have done the projection from surface to plane. And X indicates easting 
and uh, Y indicate northing, okay, uh, in the UTM zone. In UTM, each zone has its own coordinates, and also northern and southern zone have their own uh, coordinate system, okay? So the first question is, where is the origin for the UTM? In UTM projection, origins are set on purpose so that all coordinates on uh, this zone are positive, okay? So we don't have any negative coordinates in the UTM. So let's first talk about the uh, Northern Hemisphere. For the zones uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the origin has deliberately set to a location on equator. First of all, it's on equator, and it's 500 kilometer west of Central Meridian. Okay, so this is Central Meridian, and this is equator. Okay, so from Central Meridian, if you go 500 kilometer to the west, that's going to be the origin of the uh, northern hemisphere zones. Okay. So you can see that. So it's, this is going to be uh, the origin of the northern hemisphere. So you can see that the entire zone. So from here to here, the entire zone is in the first quadrants of the system. So that's why all coordinates in the system are positive with respect to the origin. And this 500 kilometer uh, from uh, that we moved from central meridian to the west is called false easting. So that's for the northern hemisphere. Okay. How about the origin in the southern hemisphere? For zones in uh, southern hemisphere, again we set up uh, origin to make all coordinates positive. So we know that. So here is the equator. Okay. And we have to go down. Uh, like 10,000 kilometer from the equator, okay? And it also, uh, we also, it should be 500 kilometer west of central meridian. So here is the central meridian. We have to go 500 kilometer to the left, okay? So, and that's gonna be the origin of the UTM projection in the southern hemisphere. Again, you can see the entire zone is now in the first quadrants of the system. And that's why all coordinates are positive. So the origin is set on purpose to make all coordinate positive. So one of the mistakes that the students have is that they think that the origin of the UTM is the intersection of the central meridian and equator. No, so it's not. For the northern hemisphere and for the southern hemisphere, we have different origins, okay? so. And finally, what is the pros and cons of the UTM system? First of all, the, U, uh, the zones are wide enough, about six degree that covers a relatively large area. But problem is the coordinates are discontinuous between different zones. That means that the coordinates you measure in zone 17, like Ohio, cannot be directly used for calculation in zones 18, like New York, because different zones have different definition of origin. And uh, this is an example of a specification of the UTM projection that you see in ArcGIS. And this is the projection part. So you can see UTM projection uh, has been used for the zone 18. And uh, where is the central meridian? So here you can see that. So the longitude of central meridian is 75 degree. And also we have false easting because 500 kilometer or 500,000 meters because we move to the left, we move to the western part uh, from central meridian, but uh, there is no false northing. We don't go down because it's for the northern hemisphere, okay? And we can also here uh, see the um, in the bottom part that's about uh, selection of the ellipsoid to choose horizontal datum. For example, the horizontal datum is North American datum 83. And also, these are characteristics of the ellipsoid. The ellipsoid that they use is a worldwide ellipsoid GRS-80. And these are the characteristics of the ellipsoid. The length of the major axis and also the flattening ratio. So make sure you are able to read, understand, and interpret the specification of the projections and also the datum.